You are listening to the Tri Order Transmissions Episode 114. And now, here are Jeff and Ian. Welcome to the Tricorder Transmissions original series coverage of Gold Key Comics, issue number 25, Dwarf Planet. I am your host, Jeff Hewlett, and with me is my co-chair for the Gold Key Comics series, Mr. Ian Adams. How are you, Ian? Doing well. How about you? Awesome. Doing doing great. Looking forward to talking through some more of these bizarre comics with you this one's another yeah. one of these really strange issues and i think uh we were talking before we started this recording about how uh maybe over optimistic we got after uh issue <laughs> after the mummies of Haitia <laughs> seven um, yeah yeah perhaps <laughs> yeah that's a well you know i i'm gonna keep my hopes up that uh we're gonna have some gems coming up here um so uh, not to not to flip the cards too early uh, on this issue, we've got a lot to talk about. So it is another one by Mr. Arnold Drake, and the artist, again, is Alberto Giolitti. He has not changed. It, it was published in July of 1974, uh, oddly getting kind of close to my birth date. Pretty cool. And um, 32 pages. Star date is 1924.8, still somewhere in those 2260s. Um, do you have any information on the cover art? Is it still the same guy? Yeah, it's George Wilson. Hmm, yeah, this one's a little bit of a different style. It looks, well, the, the people looked about the same, but the cover itself is a bit different than previous covers. It kind of feels almost more Twilight zone and I think it's just because of that giant eye. Mm, yeah, I wasn't sure what that was, if that's some kind of a an eyeball looking through a lens, or if that's some sort of a space eye. This is this is a tough cover to, <laughs> to decipher. Yeah. There's so much going on. You've got a red shirt guy climbing up what looks to be a needle, which is a little bit right. strange. It looks like it could be Scotty from the cover, but yeah. uh, we can never be too sure. <laughs> With these, right. these covers. It's it's one of those things where everything on the cover makes sense after you read the issue, but Yeah, that's a good point. Before you read the issue, like, what the heck is this? Right. So th there's also a guy in a gold shirt who I don't think that looks like Kirk at all, but I think we're gonna find out. No, but he's Kirk. got the rank stripes for Kirk. He does. That's one good thing about it. And he's getting he's getting tangled up by a bunch of tether lines that are coming out of these little tiny spaceships and it looks like there's a couple of little guys uh laying on the ground pulling some of these ropes down it's almost yeah. like a sort of a gulliver uh gulliver's travels scenario um but i didn't right. really get the whole burning yellow sphere part he's inside a burning yellow sphere right and that's yet another thing that makes sense once the issue has gone on right because mm. that's supposed to be the sun of this planet but yeah, good observation. Yeah, that's yeah, we're 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 getting ahead of ourselves again, but yeah, that is the explanation. Right. But looking at the cover, if you were standing at the sh on the shelf looking at a comic shelf and you saw this cover, this would make no sense to you. No, it wouldn't, but uh, I got to say it's it's a really appealing design, like the, the just the composition of it and and all of the sort of weird things going on. I think that if I did see this, you know, in a in a drugstore as you probably would have seen him at the time, I would have been like, okay, yeah, let's check this one out. This looks, looks weird enough. Yeah, it's only a quarter. Why not? Right. Let's give it a shot. It's uh, only a week's pay. Yeah, and there's a little, <laughs> um, there's a little blurb on the cover here, a little one-liner, uh, like they have on all of them, and it says, "Miniature people under a strange sun threaten the lives of the Enterprise crew." Doesn't give you much to go on, but uh, once again, our crew is in danger as they are in yeah. many, many issues. So um, any other thoughts on the cover, Ian? Well, just one observation. Uh, it's worth noting that this is one of those rare issues um, 
at least the the copy that you and I have, uh, where the logo instead of being gold key is yes. under the Whitman imprint. Yes, Whitman. that's the wasn't that the isn't that the parent company of Gold right. Key? Right. Yep. Yeah, I wonder what that was about. Yeah, I don't know. Um, because from what I've been able to find out, you can all of these issues where it appears like that, you can find covers you know with either the Whitman or the gold key logo so it's like they made versions of each hmm. and uh i'm not sure if it was like you know a different market uh yeah, thing or or um you know who it was distributed to or anything like that hmm. um i'm yeah still still a little befuddled by it but i do think it's interesting whenever it comes up because it seems rare yeah it, i i picked up on it but it i wasn't sure if that was um you know something that uh, was going to be something going forward or if they just it was a kind of a company change or uh, but i i kind of i had read a bit about whitman uh publishing and gold key was one of the subsidiaries so uh kind of made sense it's a it's interesting little logo it's a little smiley face on it with a big w and the name of the company written in a w so it almost looks like a logo for like a kid's toy store yeah, like Child World. There used to be a store called Child World. I don't know, it's not around anymore. It was a Toys R Us competitor. And I think it had a similar logo or something kind of close to that, like a, like a round globe or something. But getting off track. Getting off track. Uh, <laughs> anything else? We never do that. Oh, no, not, uh, not No, let's, let's, uh, let's get back on track. <laughs> okay, good call. So um, we're going to open up this issue and we're going to start talking about it. So we're going to give you guys the spoiler warning, as we always do, if you feel like tuning out and reading the comic and then coming back in uh, feel free to do that and uh, we'll be waiting here for you when you get back but we're going to start talking about the teaser page for dwarf planet in three two one engage engage so now here we are with once again a teaser page that is far and away different than what we saw yeah on the cover i mean this is really really weird but i really like this yeah it's so it is bizarre. yes like and did, were you thrown off by the fact that it's not called the dwarf planet it's just called dwarf planet i don't uh, know really that's no flow for me i i, I would have thought it would sound better the dwarf planet but yeah it does work for me uh in in light of the recent you know, planetary classifications. I, I had an idea that maybe that, you know, when I first read the the title, that this issue was about a completely different thing. Uh, <laughs> that quickly went away as soon as you know you get further down the page and you listen to who certainly already appears to be Scotty just based on the the kind of accent they're trying to give him. Hmm. So this page depicts a, uh, a a human being wearing uh, a polka dotted loincloth blue with white <laughs> polka dots and he's hurling rocks at what appears to be some sort of a worm he's calling it a hairy legged microbe um, so i'm not quite sure exactly what it is at this point we'll find out later what it is much later <laughs> what it is yeah but it's a non-humanoid alien so you know me and and my love for non-humanoid aliens in star trek so that immediately grabbed me and he's throwing rocks at it and it's making a noise that um i'll let you do the noise you're better at these noises than i am <laughs> great that was perfect yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's shrieking in pain uh, as these rocks are being thrown at it by this humanoid and as ian said i it's pretty obvious that they're trying to make us understand this is scotty just by the way they're making him speak and um, you know gold key in the past has been quite famous for mimicking scotty's uh, accent in text so the 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 bubble says uh what kind o way is this for a lad like me to be dying trampled by a hairy legged microbe and notice i'm not doing the accent right yeah <laughs> you did it as about as well as they wrote it <laughs> yes <laughs> so yeah, that's I, apparently that's that's supposed to be Scotty's accent, and it's got the sh the same haircut, but the profile uh, and the musculature doesn't look Scottyish to me. But that's okay. Yeah. Um, 
so again, there's a, also a text box that gives us a little bit of a teaser in the upper right corner that says, Come along with the crew of the Starship Enterprise as they race to solve the mystery of a world in which all life is rapidly shrinking. Dash, dash, oh, two, dash, dash, oblivion. Scary. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, what, what are we in store for here? So, uh, yeah, you know, this to me is a, a really cool teaser page. I really, really enjoyed this teaser page. And, you know, I after looking at the cover and flipping it open and seeing something that I did not expect, I was hoping that this issue was going to feature these kind of gross looking alien things more prominently. I'm sad that it didn't. It's kind of another thing. We've talked about it before where with the gold key issues, they've kind of had a problem where they tend to just meander through the first two thirds Mm -hmm. of the, uh, of the stories and then try to jam everything into that last third. And, and, and this, this thing spoiler alert it shows up in the last third and uh so that's why we don't really get to see a whole lot of them which is kind of sad this i am sad to say that this issue is another one of those gold keys where they just they drag their feet (laughs) through the the (laughs) first two thirds or even more than the first two thirds and then really go gangbusters trying to wrap the story up and uh so once again we're gonna be um we're going to be lamenting the fact that the end wraps up so quickly. So another spoiler alert, but anything else yeah. you want to throw out there about this teaser page before we jump in? No, um, just that, you know, it's, it's, it's cool. It is. <laughs> but other than that, other than that, let's get to it. All right. <clears throat> All right. So, oh, you know what? Actually, before we do, I, one more thing that was, what struck me as odd is that in this teaser page, it looks like, this scene is happening in some sort of a desert, right? Yeah. It does. And then we find out that it's actually not a desert. That really threw me for a loop when we get to the part where we find out what this scene really is. So uh, bear with us. We'll get there. But um, I was a little bit disappointed that this wasn't some sort of a big battle happening <laughs> in this arid <laughs> climate. Between our loincloth uh, enterprise <laughs> All right. So... We are going to jump into the issue proper here and starts out, of course, uh, with a captain's log, which I'll quickly read off. It says, Captain's Log, Stardate 1924.8. Lieutenant Uhuru, misspelled again, Chief Comm Officer has detected intelligent radio signals from the little explored area of space, Sector 119D! Exclamation point. So does that mean... That the radio signals came from intelligent people or that the radio signals themselves were intelligent? I'm taking it as the radio signals themselves were intelligent. That's the way it's written. I, it's it's the only way that makes sense. It is. It is. <laughs> oh, So uh, Captain Kirk, uh, Spock, and Uhura uh, take a shuttlecraft down to the surface of a planet in Sector 119D in order to investigate these radio signals. They discover that there is a highly advanced city, and they land right in the middle of it, but find that the city is deserted. Uh, the landing party kind of walks around a bit, winds up in a little bit, little town uh, nearby, and, which happens to be a little smaller than the place that they landed, and finds that town empty as well. So they set out and keep exploring more of the planet on foot, instead of getting back in the shuttlecraft, by the way, and discover that there's another city less than a mile away from the first two, and it's even smaller. It's like a miniature city. So, yeah, it's 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 really it's really tiny. It's really tiny. It's like those Russian dolls. You just oh the nesting smaller ones within smaller ones. Uh, the buildings and the trees are uh, waist high, about waist high, and there are abandoned vehicles all over the place. So um, let's see. In the city, that city is abandoned, and Ahura expo- exclaims it's a midget city. Uh, and they're doing some theorizing about... Um, That's a little... Yeah, it's on the nose. Um, they, they, yep. they start to theorize a little bit about there having been potentially uh, two to three different size races living all within proximity of each other, size-wise, meaning, you know, taller than 
than the others, but uh, but they're they're confused by where all the intelligent life is gone and where the radio signals are coming from, and uh, they decide to split up to explore more of the territory and agree to meet back in three hours. So Kirk goes off on his own, and as he's walking around, he sees a miniature flying ship fly past him and it kind of flies off into the distance a little bit and lands behind a hill and he starts to to move towards where it landed uh, to try to figure out what's going on he assumes it's some kind of a toy and he finds it parked on the on the ground and picks it up and is still looking at it and trying to figure out what it is and trying to find out who was piloting it he assumes that it's being remotely controlled uh, he picks it up, looks at it, but it flies out of his hand. He's unable to hold it. So uh, a couple minutes later, uh, an, a large group of these ships appears and begins firing tether lines uh, at Kirk that have weights on the end uh, and start to tangle him up and, and tear him to the ground. So they wind up uh, getting him on the ground a lot like uh, Gulliver's Travels, like we said earlier. So this yep. is the scene from the cover. <laughs> And uh, as Kirk is struggling to get free, a soldier uh, walks up and shoots him in the face with some sort of gas, which uh, immobilizes Kirk. And the tiny guy says, uh, tells Kirk not to struggle. He says every muscle in his body has been immobilized. And uh, he is talking to Kirk with some sort of a device that's on his forehead. He tells him that his name is General Kwai and Kirk is now his prisoner so we're going to stop here this is page seven so we're going to stop and talk a little bit about this uh again uhura's name is misspelled because two issues in a row now yeah where it's uh yeah misspelled and she's white again and she's white again (laughs) yes good call it's it's, you know i'm i'm starting to think that maybe maybe this uhuru is actually a completely different person. Oh, just so happens to be a communications officer, though. Right, and and it happens to wear those same hoop earrings and <laughs> wear the hair the same way. But you know, like it, it's <laughs> it I seems to make sense because they're they're at least consistent about getting the name wrong whenever she looks wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll see if it if it continues in the next issue. Um, so I think she appears again. So we'll talk about that when we get there. One thing that I uh, was going to ask you if you noticed, and I, I'm not sure, it's hard to see, but uh, on page one, uh, well, actually, wait a minute. I think for us, it's page three. It's, it's actually okay. the first page of the story, but we see the shuttlecraft flying yep. in, and... I want to say that the registry number is NCC 1701-7, but it could yep, be it, 1701-1 with kind of a wacky looking one at the end. But if it's 1701-7, what ship is that, I wonder? It's not the Galileo. That wasn't the Galileo's number, was it? Yeah, that was the Galileo's number, NCC 1701-7. All right. I'm looking at it from... Uh... When it was landed on Taurus 2 during the Galileo 7 episode. Very cool. So we've got another appearance of the Galileo, uh, unnamed, but uh, with the correct registry number. So pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. And you can kind of see on the art where the name is, right? You know, that kind of yep. slanted line in the front. Yep. Yep. Too small to read, but uh, but it's there. And the shuttlecraft, of course, is the wrong color. It's green with yellow nacelles, which is... I, a little odd. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm going with it. It was shaded, like it was passing in front of a building, and and so the the color was cast. But uh, yeah, it's a little weird. But the shuttle itself, like the shape of it, it's pretty good. It's pretty close. It's pretty close. Yeah. I think the the door is a little bit high on the side of it, but it might be tough to get in and out yeah. of once it's landed. But uh, <laughs> that's okay. We can jump. Yeah. Climb. A plus for effort. A plus for effort. So uh, it, it appears, although it doesn't turn out to be, it appears we've got yet another dead or dying civilization on our hands. Right. More deserted it's cities. It's so weird. <laughs> Man, who would have thought? In a gold key, no less. Yeah, I know. It's Yeah, it, it, it is interesting that they take the time to, you know, 
wander through this abandoned, you know, civilization. And um, it's kind of interesting, right? Because the, the, the big place that's, that's only a little bit smaller than them, you know, like the, the, the first place that they come to is the largest. And then each um, city that they come to gets progressively smaller. Mm-hmm. And the first one is like really advanced. It's got rockets and stuff. And then the, the second one they go to has a more kind of um, kind of depression era, I want to say. Yeah, the architecture changes between each one. Yeah. Right. And then and then even um, like the last one is kind of medieval, except it's got cars <laughs> that are obviously from like the, you know, 50s, which is a little weird, but kind of makes sense within the story. But I did I did think that that was a really interesting thing that the smaller they go, uh, it's almost like the further back in time they're going, you know? Hmm. That's a good point. Yeah, the the when they get to let's see, page four, the final panel, when they're in what Uhura calls the midget city. <laughs> I don't I I I don't know what it, that word really fits because the doors of that of the houses that they're standing next to are smaller than Kirk's boot which is right next to them. So, I mean, even if there were people there, they would be much, much smaller than what they would have called a midget in the seventies here right? on earth. Yeah. They'd be more like, um, like little action figure size people. Yeah. Like, you know, you play with your mega dolls in this, in this city, your mega Star Trek dolls. They call the issue, the dwarf planet, but now they're talking about midget cities. And I, I'm a little bit, confused by the naming of the issue versus what they actually wind up calling <laughs> the little city. So I would have thought they would call it Dwarf City, but... Yeah, it's a, it's a midget city with dwarfed trees. It's, uh... Yeah. <laughs> mm. Quite strange. Quite strange. Um, Page five. I love the use of the word flotilla. By Kirk, <laughs> right for for a flying squadron. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was a little bit uh, surprised to see that used in there. Kirk's exact line is, and he says "Great Scott," which I don't yep. recall Kirk ever saying "Great Scott," but he says "Great Scott." There's a whole flotilla of them now coming straight for me. Hmm. <laughs> and did you did you find it odd that Kirk assumes? just assumes that these ships are being controlled by children. Like that was yeah. the conclusion that he immediately jumped to the fact that we've seen, you know, miniature little houses. Why wouldn't he jump to the conclusion that there's people flying those ships? He just saw tiny little houses and tiny little cars. <laughs> right. Now we're seeing tiny little ships. It only stands to reason that there's little people inside them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're, they're even hypothesizing on the, the page immediately before that there might have been different races of different sizes for each of the different sized cities, one of which was the size of, you know, that rocket, like the scale of that rocket. And and none of them were of a size, you know, uh, of, of a scale comparable with Kirk and, and the crew. So, it's yeah, it's completely weird that he would just assume that it's a children. My first thought would be, oh, hey, maybe this is one of the, you know, little people who live here. One of the Lilliputians, you know? Yeah, I that, that really threw me for a loop. And did you, <laughs> did it bother you too that Kirk is pretty much telegraphing everything that's going on here? <laughs> he's describing in oh, great yeah. detail everything he's doing. <laughs> yes. Like he is Captain Exposition. He <laughs> Exactly. I mean, every every panel on on these couple of pages where Kirk is walking right. around, he's just he's telling us exactly what he's doing, even though we can see it. It was so funny to me. I was kind of chuckling. Even when the ship <laughs> flies out of his hand, is it, it's it's taking <laughs> off. I can't hold on to it. Right. Like, who's he saying this to? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's literally all alone in the middle of this wilderness by himself. Uh, a toy rocket, amazingly detailed, still warm, too. <laughs> then the child who flew it must be nearby. I'll wait here until he comes for it. <laughs> uh, and of course, it's a he. Of course. 
Of course. <laughs> oh man. So um this wraps up this section wrapped up with Kirk being captured by uh the general Kwai. And I you know, the fact that all of these ships exist and they have these uh bolas. Yeah, bolas, right? Now you would think that the fact that these ships exist, they built them for a specific purpose to take down giants. So are we assuming that other giants have shown up on this planet before and they, they realized that this was enough of a problem that they needed to build ships with weapons, especially <laughs> to capture them and take them down. I mean, what other reason would they have to build these in the first place? Yeah. And, um, not to get too far ahead, but on, on the very next page, he kind of hints that that might've happened in their past, mm-hmm. that, that there were other, you know, larger people and, and that, uh, they've encountered them before. Interesting, interesting theory. But we'll we'll see how it pans out once we get past. Do you have anything else you want to say uh, about this section before we move on? Well, I did kind of like the uh, you know it, it is a very Buck Rogersy rocket, mm-hmm. and it, it's kind of interesting because you know this issue came out in seventy four, and by seven nineteen seventy four you very rarely saw rockets looking like those sort of V2 World War II rockets with the fins and everything. Like by this time, when people think of rockets, it's, you know, the, the, um, the giant Atlas rockets and stuff like that, you know? So uh, I kind of like that just cause I've, I, I've always had a soft spot for that aesthetic. And so it was kind of neat that they, that they did that in the first place. That's that's all. <laughs> Just the you know, nice nice little uh nice little nod. It is. It's a nice nod. I I I'm not sure if this was I mean I'm assuming that this was just Alberto's taste because you know we've seen some of these interesting cities and ships and other issues that he draws yeah. that, that have that similar aesthetic. So um that must have been his preference uh, for for drawing these things, but I think it fits really well in here. It's, it gives it a yeah. nice little stylization. There's the one frame, it is on page six, the top frame, where it's got this yellow kind of explosion in the sky type thing, and the ships are all flying around Kirk. And you see some of the, the, the bola lines coming out, and you have some cool mm-hmm. sound effects written there. And Kirk is telling us that they've opened fire, shooting heavy <laughs> stranded wires. Which that's we can a, clearly see. <laughs> that's a great scene. I absolutely love that. I love the position yeah. that Kirk is in, and I love the ships are going in every which direction. Uh, really well done. You know, it, it, they didn't need necessarily four panels to show Kirk getting uh, captured by these ships, but um, I, I think that the first one there is absolutely awesome, and I'd love to have a big blown up wallpaper of that one. <laughs> Yeah, that would be kind of cool, right? Yeah. Um, I, I do think that this is, you know, getting back to that point of, of um, taking their time, taking too much time telling the story in the in the first two thirds. This whole section, I think you could have done in four pages max, but I'd probably have shot even for three. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And you know, Kirk getting captured, uh, getting, getting, uh, fi- seeing the first ship and then getting captured is uh, like one, two, three, four, four ish pages. Yeah. Uh, just that. Um, <laughs> you know, we could have used a, a little more of that space to, to reclaim, but well, that's, it's gold key for you. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's, it's just kind of, um, like storytelling has certainly uh, in comics anyway, has certainly uh, evolved Hmm. over the years. And uh, a lot of that I would say came, you know, because of people like Jack Kirby, you know, who, who had a much more uh, economical style and, and went by that um, cinematic rule of show don't tell. And I think that, that, you know, these writers and artists who were still working in that era that was, you know, kind of towards the beginning of when that was starting to really be a thing, 
hadn't quite um, gotten into that yet. And I think that that's, that's what it's reflective of. I, I would definitely agree with that. So we are moving on. We're starting up on page number eight, which is, I think, seven for you guys out there listening if you're reading a physical copy of this. And we are picking up where Kirk has been captured. And uh, he's kind of having a little bit of a dialogue here with um, this Kwai gentleman. And uh, he's kind of being taunted a little bit. And Kwai is telling him that, uh, you know, because he's a giant and there'll be other ones coming uh, just by the fact that he's seen Kirk already. So he's going to take him back to his people. He doesn't want um, his small race to become slaves to the giants or pets or sideshow freaks uh, in his name. So um, Kirk gets strapped to a wooden apparatus with little wooden wheels on it, (laughs) and they roll him. Actually, this is interesting because there's two cranes that lift Kirk up and then put him on (laughs) this wooden apparatus. So a little bit of a strange uh, use of technology. And uh, anyway, Kirk is rolled back to the city and brought in front of a president who gives him a little bit on a little bit of what's going on here and lets him know that once everyone there was as tall as Kirk and they were and had lived a very happy life. Everybody was joyous until some explosions uh, around their sun, uh, fantastic, intense explosions rocked their planet and uh, life or their lives changed from that point on. Suddenly, uh, they all started to shrink with each passing day. They were in, they tried to investigate what was going on to see if they can figure out how to stop it, but the shrinking problem continued. So they built themselves the uh, second city on their planet, which they're calling Farah Two, and uh, the next generation was forced to build an even smaller city called Farah Three to accommodate the smaller and smaller people. So the old cities wound up being museums. Of their past. So in time, their scientists did figure out what the cause was, but by then it was too late. So their ships were much too small to reach the sun. And even if they did know how to stop the rays, they they couldn't have done it anyway. So each generation grows successively smaller. And in time, she says, they'll all be microscopic. So all their advanced tools and machines will be lost and they will essentially vanish. So Ohura steps up and suggests that using the Enterprise to transport the inhabitants of the planet Kujal away, but the president refuses and their people are too proud to leave their home world. They don't want to give up and and retreat. So Kirk offers to help resolve the situation and the president takes some time to think about it. Meanwhile, she allows the Enterprise crew to meet up with each other and we find that Spock and Ohura were stashed underneath the stage there. (laughs) So um, that. that was pretty sad. <laughs> uh, but we'll get to that in a second. I'm sure we're going to discuss that a little yep. bit. So um, Kirk proposes that they fly close to the sun and gather samples of the rays and study them and hope they can figure out how to reverse the process. But of course, uh, going that close to the sun will uh, cause themselves to shrink at a much more rapid rate. So um, the closer they get, the faster they'll shrink. So um, the president and the general Kwai have been listening in and they agree to the plan. So Kwai demands, though, that a hostage be left behind to make sure the Enterprise isn't just going to escape and and leave them in the lurch. So um, Ahura steps up and volunteers to be the hostage. So um, we're going to stop here on page 14. And uh, we'll discuss some of those things that have been happening here. And let's see. I thought page nine, panel one, when uh, Kirk is captured, (laughs) he says the only thing he regrets was that he couldn't get a warning to Spock and Uhura. I thought it was really strange that that was the one thing he regretted. He didn't regret, uh, (laughs) you know, not running. (laughs) Yeah, when he saw the ships coming, uh, he didn't he didn't regret not fighting back harder or swatting the ships out of the sky, but he regrets not getting the warning out. Yeah, and and that actually I was kind of waiting for that because in that whole sequence, remember you were just saying that it took like you know four pages from 
the spotting of that first rocket ship to, you know, him being, you know, taken down and immobilized. And it's only three panels before that last page on page, uh, page seven, page six for everyone else that he even tries to use his communicator to alert the others as to what's going. Yeah, good, good point. He doesn't actually pull the communicator out until he's already tied down. Yeah. I would have been like, as soon as he sees that <laughs> flotilla uh, coming towards him, I would have been like, Scotty or uh, Spock, Uhura, there's, you know, this a whole bunch of rocket ships coming towards me. You know, like by then, you know, he would have had enough time to do things like, you know, uh, let them home in on his position and and stuff like that. Uh, he didn't even have to be in that situation in the first place captured you know exactly or he at least he could have signaled the ship and let them know what his position was right what's the protocol yeah but of course um the reason he doesn't even end up getting an answer from uh uhura or spock is because they're they're underneath the president (laughs) oh man that was that was funny i did not expect to see that uh the the little curtain gets pulled up and we see uhura and spock laying face down on their yeah. stomachs underneath the stage yeah sad very scene. um <laughs> very sad scene but <laughs> i thought it was interesting that on page nine on the third panel you see a thought bubble uh on over kirk's head where he is shocked to see and he says a, he's thinking a woman leader when he sees the president is female. Um, but it's not, it's not, um, not a bad surprise. He said, it's a more advanced world than many, but I thought it was interesting that they called that out that he, you know, they, they put a a balloon up there to, to let us know that Kirk was uh, shocked by that. Pretty forward thinking there for 1974. And let's see, beta gas. Kirk has been sprayed by beta gas and there's an antidote. (laughs) Yeah, presumably alpha gas would have killed him, and 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 gamma gas probably would have just uh... turned him into the hole. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> nice. So yeah, more. But you know, the fact that there is a there's a thing called beta gas that that paralyzes giants, and there's an antidote that they have on hand, it, more of an indication that they've done this before. Exactly. Yeah, and and even just that that they had that um, rolling wooden platform thing just on standby yeah like it, it certainly seems that there is a, a history with uh as we would think of ourselves normal sized people as they would think of giants yes and um i, I kind of wish that they had um you know gone into because you remember the past few issues there there have been a few kind of flashback scenes yep where they they kind of just describe the past of the planet and i kind of wish that that had been the flashback for this you know because they they spend it they spend their flashback going on to how they just got smaller and smaller but i kind of want to learn about you know how these people kind of decided that people who were giants would make them slaves or household pets or worse sideshow freaks yeah. and uh you know, and and I kind of imagined that General Kwai here was kind of like, um, oh, what was his name, Aldo, in the later Planet of the Apes movies. Ah, oh, okay. Right, where where he was the general who was fighting to make sure that you know that that the that the apes never became slaves and pets and all that again, and um, that he's kind of got that same role. And I kind of feel like maybe this society didn't even have a military until, you know, these previous giants came and 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 all that. And I don't know. I mean, that, that's that's all that I just picked up just from those subtle hints that they dropped. And I kind of felt like that was the more interesting sort of backstory that I wish they had flashed back to. I, you know what? I, that's a great point, and I have to. I agree. I think that would have been a much more interesting, and and fun story to to read through is the battles with these past giants and and how they've gotten so good at catching them, right? And why they have all of these machines and spaceships and and cranes to lift them up 
and place them on the big rolling wooden carts. And I, I think that would have been much more interesting. Yeah. And, and it, it would have created some interesting conflict, right? Because, because then you'd have a little more insight into why these, you know, little people want to um, subjugate and, or, or at least subdue and maybe imprison or whatever the enterprise crew. And it would have been kind of a struggle. It's not, it's not quite the word that I mean, but like when, when the enterprise crew, you know, Kirk and, and them, when they come up with the idea of like, Hey, I know let's just go out to the sun and like figure out like how to reverse this thing. Like it just kind of seems like, well, you know, they've been really mean to us, but yeah, we'll just go out and do it. You know, we do science stuff all the time. We'll just figure it out, you know, done. Right. But like, like they could have had more of a, more of a, a conflict, right? Like, um, because they end up really readily convincing, you know, the, the general and the president both. Yeah. It didn't take much. Yeah. Whereas had they gone into that backstory a little bit, then you could have had them playing off, you know, being a bit more, um, resistive, resistant rather, sorry, to that idea, you know, to the idea of trusting these giants. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, I, I feel like it, it would have made for, a you know, a more interesting story. Once again, we're rewriting gold key. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's what I do. Maybe we should start writing our own Trek comics. Oh wait, you yeah. are. That's right. <laughs> you are. Uh, page 10, panel two. Another one of my favorite gold key features, a disembodied head tells a story. Right. <laughs> I love it. So you get the, the disembodied head or the bust rather of the president. Cause you've got the neck and shoulders there as well. And she's kind of looking sternly off into the distance as she attempts to uh, tell <laughs> the story, regaling the subdued enterprise away team. That's mm -hmm. the story. So that's, that's one of the gold key things. It doesn't happen every issue. But uh, when it does happen, it's very special. Last time it was Kirk's disembodied head. Yep. So I look forward to seeing more of them. <laughs> and we will, I'm sure. So here's a science problem that I had. With this oh, issue. boy. <laughs> I, I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. Uh, page 11, panel 2 tells us that radio waves created mm -hmm. by the explosions on the sun are causing people to shrink uh yeah. you know what no uh-uh yeah why could they not have picked a different kind of waves they could have just made one up for god's right. sake they've done it in a million <laughs> trek episodes before they yeah talk and about even even in other old keys yeah oh my god radio waves man come on we're right. bombarded with radio waves all day long in our lives and we don't shrink so i don't yeah i don't get the use of radio waves here it's just something that, like, maybe they meant to say radiation of some kind, but then, you know, like, it's a really densely packed word balloon, and maybe they just ran out of space. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to trying to be generous no, with no. this one, but, yeah, it's really hard to get past. It is, and I, I don't want, I don't want to, people out there to think that we're just bashing these comics, but this is... A this is a serious question that popped up in my head. I'm like, that's such a weird choice because they've, they've gone in previous issues. They've gone out of their way to try to make, you know, science at least somewhat reasonable and plausible. Yeah. Or at least unknown. Right. And you pointed some of these things out in the past. So this one really kind of just made me grimace when I read it. Like, Oh, come on. We couldn't have just picked a different yeah. word than radio. It could have been anything. It could have been like radar waves or something. It could have been even close to radio, but just, you know, yeah. make something up. And and it's also really weird how they're like, well, we don't know what's it's maybe it's something uh with their son that's doing this. Oh, well maybe uh maybe if we could alter a star and then Spock's like, Well, quite impossible, you know, we 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 could never do that and uh, even if the entire universe got together nobody could do that, which is A wrong. <laughs> you know? because uh, they, we see people do that in Star Trek, you know. Oh, yeah. But then, you know, Kirk's like, well, obviously the only hope lies in understanding these waves. So we know nothing about these waves. And then, you know, he, he mentions it's on page 13. There's a panel of um, Kirk and Uhura. And uh, she's saying, well, have you thought what these rays might do to us? And he's like, well, probably shrink ourselves as it does, did theirs. And the closer we get, 
the faster the process. How do you know that when you already admitted that you don't know anything about these rays other than that they're shrinking these people over generations? That's the sort of thing that you want to fly to the sun to collect data on in the first place to learn. You know, don't. Yeah, it, that just struck me as really weird. Yeah, I, I agree. And the panel immediately following that one, they use a machine that they call an audio magnifier uh, to listen in on Kirk, Spock, and Uhura's conversation. The little the little people are using this audio magnifier. Isn't that an amplifier? Yeah, that's exactly what it is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Magnification is a visual term. Right. It usually doesn't apply to audio. Um, but um, yeah, I, I was scratching my head at that one so we've got radio waves that are caused by explosions on a sun and we've got an audio magnifier so uh, a little strange yeah. use of terminology uh, in this one but i think one really redeeming thing that i think this comic does and we were just lamenting the treatment of uhura in the previous issue i think mm -hmm. that uhura is is very well redeemed in this issue uh she's oh, absolutely. heroic She's much more intelligent. I think this the fact that she steps up and volunteers to be the hostage is awesome. Yeah, she even helps them brainstorm, like, you know, what to do with the sun, you know, the mission to the sun and all of that. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. She's a lot more, she's a lot more the, the kind of Uhura that, that we expect. Exactly. So very happy to see uh, that they're utilizing Uhura uh, as, a, as a, a useful and intelligent character. In, mm -hmm. this, in this issue, as uh, which they failed to do in some previous ones. Yeah. So uh, very, very good on the author. Anything else that you want to say about this section before we move <laughs> on? Uh -oh. Just that, you know, if if I had received a, a gift in a box like that, I, you know, I would have just, I would have cracked it open and been like, hey, this is really cool that you got us a gift. I wonder what it is, yeah. you know, and open it up instead of like, Leaving it closed. Uh, yeah. Leaving it closed until they get back to the ship and then still not even bothering to open it up, just setting it on a shelf somewhere, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so that these, you know, little Trojans can jump out of it like like it's a giant wooden horse. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And well, anyway, that that's something that I would have thought maybe they would have picked up when they transport it up as well. <laughs> yeah, we're detecting two really small biosigns. Yeah, extra life forms are being beamed up because wouldn't you have to say uh, four to beam up instead of two? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Perhaps not. Yeah, well, we'll we'll forgive him that one. Although uh, I, I want to get into those those two soldiers that, that beam up with them uh, in the next section, but there is something a little weird about them. All right, well, I'll wait to hear your your theories about these guys uh, until we get to this next section. So we're picking back up on page 15. This is the, the comic says this is part two. And we're starting with what I think is a really great opening shot of the Enterprise. Mm -hmm. We're finally totally getting agree. a really well-drawn, well-proportioned Enterprise from a really cool angle. I yeah. really dig this shot. And I, and I love the background, too, with yeah. the, the sun and that, you know, sort of uh, kind of looks almost like, you know, the Milky Way in the background. And um, I'm, I'm guessing that's the planet below them. Yeah, that dark, swirly, uh, black and purple thing. Yeah, it, it's just it's a really cool composition. It really, really is. So uh, finally, nice to finally see a great shot of the Enterprise again that we don't have to pick apart because of the proportions are all off <laughs> right but um all right so uh let's see ahura's down on the planet and um she's talking with the the president a little bit doing some brainstorming and while the enterprise is up in space approaching the sun uh using a special anti-radio wave shielding uh to protect the inhabitants of the ship from the harmful radio wave so sulu attempts to raise something called a radio energy analyzer dish but it jams so scotty volunteers to go outside and repair it wearing a special protective suit 
So mm-hmm. he's out there, he's walking on the outside of the ship and he's struggling to free the dish, but he finally uh, is able to get it freed from its housing. But, but just, but just as he does it, he winds up falling down and uh, kind of crumpling to the ground as if he was hurt. So Kirk quickly jumps in another one of the suits and goes out to the outside of the ship to rescue Scotty, but finds an empty space suit where Scotty was. So he grabs the suit and brings it back inside, and they discover, upon further examination, that a very tiny little Scotty is still inside the suit, shrunken down as small as some of the people on the planet below. So Kirk examines the suit and finds that there's a rip in the fabric that must have happened while he was trying to free the dish, and that was enough to allow the dangerous rays to pour into the suit and cause Scotty to shrink. So Spock warns uh, Kirk that Scotty is shrinking much faster because he was exposed to a much higher concentrated dose of the rays. And at the rate his body was shrinking, he may become microscopic in size very, very soon. So uh, at that point, Spock says that uh, the very bacteria in the air will menace him as much as prehistoric mammoth would us, and they must Mm -hmm. act at once. So here we're getting a little foreshadowing of what we saw on the teaser page. Aha. So Dr. McCoy constructs a small kind of glass dome and puts Scotty inside it to protect him. And uh, not long (laughs) after that, Scotty shrinks so much that he is no longer visible to the naked eye. So McCoy has to pull out a special apparatus in order to see him, but they know that he is going to be safe because the sterile atmosphere that he's in uh, doesn't allow any uh, bacteria or other microbes to get in there. So he should be perfectly safe. But just then, our two uh, Kujal spies who we saw were uh, hidden in the box that they gave Kirk on the planet below these guys by the name of Marta and Dello rush out of their hiding place and attack the air hose that leads to Scotty's bubble, making a, a little bit of a hole in there and allowing something to get in. So McCoy grabs the two of them and puts them in a storage box and repairs the hose, but says there's no way of knowing what kind of microscopic matter might have floated in. So we're going to stop again here and talk a little bit about what was going on. So there was another captain's log here, and I'll quickly read the captain's log. I should have read this when we started, but forgive me. It says, Captain's Log, Stardate 1924.9, en route toward the sun of the planet Kujal, where we hope to find the key to the mystery of that shrinking world. So once again, we're kind of mimicking the uh, the TV show in giving a kind of a catch-up uh, as you yep. start the, the next part of this it was kind of like coming back from those commercial breaks. But um, so the ship, as it says here, it, the ship has anti radio wave shielding. Hmm. Mm-hmm. It's the first time I think I've ever heard that. But it's yeah, interesting. So does that mean that no radio waves can penetrate the outside of the ship? I guess that's what it is. Yeah, I, I well, you know. I just kind of kept choosing to read it as anti-radiation shielding (laughs) rather than, you know, that specific, you know, size of, of, of electromagnetic radiation, you know, that, that makes up the radio. Fair enough. And, and yeah, I mean, cause they've, they've got to have stuff like that, right. You know, cause they're, they're, the ship is going to be bombarded by cosmic rays and, you know, all sorts of, um, you know, high energy, stuff that just exists out in space right sure. and so you know uh but it is interesting right because they they don't know what the deal is with this you know particular radiation as i'm calling it um and so they don't know what properties it has and therefore they don't know if their shielding will protect against it so it, it you know it, it makes sense I'm, I'm i'm okay with it being a thing that was already you know built into the enterprise and them not being certain whether or not it'll help protect them. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I'm so used to, uh, you know, shows like Next Gen where they're always configuring the shields to do other things. <laughs> right. So I wasn't really sure if this the comic intended us to believe that, I know this came out way before Next Gen, but they didn't do a lot of this stuff in TOS. So I wasn't sure if the comic was 
uh, intending to make us believe that the ship had some sort of built-in protection against these rays, or if this was something that they kind of configured on the fly to protect yeah, themselves. I, I just kind of read it as something built in, but yeah. Hmm. Uh, six, page 16, panel one, there's that uh, RE analyzer dish that they yes. mentioned. This is another part of the ship a uh, piece of equipment that I don't recall ever hearing about before. So neat little bit of a gold key uh, cannon for the ship there. Some other yeah. uh, apparatus that we have available. And maybe it's just me. I, I want to get your take on this because mm -hmm. we see it, right? Because Scotty's out on top of the ship, you know, yep. walking up to it and he has to, you know, climb this little dome and everything to, to get to it. Is that, is that on top of the bridge, do you think? I was wondering that myself, and I... It, the proportions on that frame, this is, by the way, if you guys are following along with us in this comic book, this is page 17 for us, probably 16 for you. Uh, panel 1, it, there's a an image of Scotty walking up to this dome where this dish is on top of it, but to me, that look, the proportions are off. That doesn't look big enough to be the dome on top of the bridge. I thought the dome on top of the bridge was transparent. Well, yeah. And, and so that's what I'm saying is that that dome that the little disc thing pops out of is the dome on top of the bridge. And what Scotty's doing is he's walking on the top of the bridge to get to it. I want to think it's below. I want to think it's the bottom of the saucer. Set. Oh, Oh yeah. The little, um, the little glowy disc part that's on the bottom center of the saucer. Is that mm -hmm. what you're thinking? That's what I was thinking. Um, yeah. Probably not. I mean, they would have drawn it upside down maybe, but I, I was thinking that that's where it was. Cause I, I, my brain does not think this is the top of the bridge. Although maybe that was the intention of the artist. Yeah. But I don't know how, why this would be, this dish would be on top of the bridge and why the dome would be so small. Um, I would think the dome would be a lot bigger than that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, it, but it is cool that we actually get to see an EVA that much. Yes. I think we can both agree on. I, I do like that. That's really cool that we're getting to see that. And um, I like the fact that Spock and Kirk are watching Scotty mm -hmm. inside and uh, kind of telegraphing everything that he's doing yeah. as well. Uh, you know, that they're all doing a, like a play by play. Kirk is talking about, yeah, it's jammed all right. Look at him struggling. <laughs> I wish I could communicate with him. Captain Exposition strikes again. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, Spock has to tell us that the radio signals wouldn't get through the foil. So Scotty's got a special suit on that has anti-radio foil gear. Oh, you know, I, I didn't notice that before. So that, to me, means that radio waves are a really big problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in gold key Apparently. because they have suits that are specially made to have uh, anti-radio foil on them so that you can walk in, in these radio waves and not be shrunken. So does that mean that they knew already that radio waves would shrink people? That's why they had to protect themselves from them by making these special suits? Or maybe it's because of, you know, when they encountered greys <laughs> oh. and they, were, they they had the foil on to keep them from stealing their brain waves, right? Oh, right? yeah, it's a tinfoil hat. Yeah, a tinfoil suit. That's right. I got. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. like it. I like where you're going with that. <laughs> <laughs> How can we never see Grace in Star Trek? I don't know. So yeah, I, 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 again, as you said, I love the fact that this is. I think this is the first hull walk we've seen. Uh, we've seen them outside the ship. Yeah, before, I think you may be right. Floating in space, we've seen that playing space ball, but uh, this oh, is the first hull we, walk. We did see one shot, I forget which issue it was on, but there was one where there were like two people out uh, messing around, like doing maintenance or something on one of the nacelles. Do you remember that? Yeah, yep. But even then it was like they they weren't, it wasn't a walk. It wasn't like, you know, that kind of um, Star Trek first contact kind of yes. thing. Your, your magnetic boots on. Yeah. They just they just use their rocket packs to get straight back into the ship. Um, and yeah, they were floating, you know, so it wasn't it wasn't walking like Scotty's doing here. 
and and it's the walking that I appreciate. Yeah, I do too. And there's a great shot on uh, page 18, the first panel. You see Kirk standing mm-hmm. on the hull of the ship over the the crumpled up suit. I yeah. really dig that shot. That's that's really neat. And these these spacesuits look quite a bit different than some of the other spacesuits we've already seen. Uh, yeah. Old key. So. Uh, but then these these are also special purpose suits apparently right because they've got you mm-hmm. know the 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 tin foil shielding or whatever exactly but they don't mention anything about the boots being magnetic we just though assume that yeah that's how they're being they're able to stay attached to the hull yeah you know i mean if if that kind of technology was normal to you you probably wouldn't mention it either right probably not <laughs> but I, <laughs> I do love though that he's he's in the boots <laughs> yeah i love that he's in the boots and i i I can't look at page 18 final panel without cracking up laughing. Seeing Kirk <laughs> poking his finger through his the finger, hole yes, of and the wiggling space it. suit and wiggling it. That and it looks really dirty to me. <laughs> Doesn't it? It looks like he's yeah. doing some sort of a, <laughs> sort of a, a lewd gesture with his yeah. finger because we don't know exactly where that hole yeah. in the suit is, but it sure looks like it's around the waist area. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> oh man. Oh, yeah. Now we know what really caused the hole. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And Scotty's like, and he, you know, he's naked and hanging out inside the boot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just for added comedic effect. Yeah. And you know, there's on page uh, 20, I think there's a, there's a, some really, really good illustrations of McCoy here, uh, especially in the third panel where he's looking at the glass dome and you see a close up of McCoy's face. I think it really looks like DeForest Kelly to me. Yeah. And, and even the page before that, um, you've got a good likeness of, of DeForest on the first panel and then good, good depictions of, um, Kirk and Spock on the last two panels of that one. Yeah. Good close up. Yeah. There. Yeah. Especially the intense Spock one, uh, the last panel. I totally agree. I, I feel like this is where, you know, he he definitely spent a lot of time getting those faces just right, and it's probably because because of the fact that Scotty's shrinking, we have to see you know kind of close ups of them because they have to seem large. Oh, good point. So I, yeah. I like this. Um, it looks like a vacuum cleaner hose. Yes, <laughs> attached to the the little dome. I I there's a little thing about that though that kind of confused me, right? Mm-hmm. Because. You know, Scotty gets put in there to so that it's a it's a sterile atmosphere and everything. There's no microscopic hoobajubes or anything. How does he get in there without introducing more? That's a good question, right? Mm-hmm. And c- especially because there's only one hose going to it. Yep. So presumably that's where the air is coming from, not being sucked out. You know, into right. Because, you know, if it was like a vacuum and he just plopped him in there, then, you know, he'd, he'd die pretty quickly. Yeah, there's no air exchange in there. There's no air exchange. So how did they suck out anything that was if they, if they just put the dome down on top of him and exactly. then sucked everything out? They would have sucked him out, too, probably. I mean, that, that would be a hell of a vacuum inside there. Yeah. And, and you notice that conveniently, this is left up to our imagination because in one panel... Scotty is literally in McCoy's hand. Mm-hmm. And then in the next panel, he's in the dome. He's, yep. So we never get to see how he got in there. We have no idea. <laughs> we just have to figure it's, it out it's, for ourselves. It's the magic of plot. It is the magic of gold key. And speaking of the magic of gold key, one of my favorite things about this issue is in is on page 20 in the second panel. I love the fact that... <laughs> That because Scotty is so small, his text has to be really small, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Which kind of makes sense, right? You know, if you were smaller, you'd be moving less air, so you'd be quieter. It is, but it's still all in capital letters, yeah. so he's yelling. Yep. Yeah. As and, and, and with uh... – <laughs> yeah. I love it. And, I and they, was they still don't use periods. It's all exclamation points. Yes. Oh, uh, God. I love that. I love that. <laughs> So great. So yeah. uh, anything else uh, before we move on to the the wrap-up? Well, it's funny you should say wrap-up because that was the last thing that I wanted to, to mention. Well, not the last thing, but the, uh, the, the kerchief that McCoy gives him mm. 
you know, okay, yeah, it looks a little silly because it's, you know, polka dotted and all that. But I thought it was kind of a nice touch, right? That, yeah. okay, you know, they, they, they give it to him and he's wearing it. And then as he shrinks, like as, and, and then we get to see that he's shrunk, he's torn off bits of it. Yes. To make it still useful without, you know, just being, you know, a giant blanket that he's kind of lost in. <clears throat> so I, I, I thought that was a nice touch. And then the other thing, I think this will be the last thing in this section that I really wanted to mention, is that the soldiers, all the way back at the beginning of this section, they're, they're saying, well, how can we stop them from completing this mission? Mm-hmm. Right? Because they don't want the, the ship to return to uh, Kujal. Right. And, you know, supposedly turn them into slaves, getting into that backstory that we never got again. And so they're, they're even specifically talking about how, you know, even our small weapons can pierce a tube or melt a wire, you know, something that would stop the yeah. ship from making it back. And yet, what's the move that they make? They fire at the tube in the little sterilization dome, yeah. which wouldn't have any effect whatsoever on the ship. Why did they do that? I have no idea. I was I was hoping you were going to bring that up. That's why I didn't bring it up. I thought that's where you were going. And yeah. yeah, it made no I was fully expecting them to, you know, be in some sort of a system in the ship and like take out navigation or something by, you know, shooting the inside of the control panel on the bridge up or something like that. Yeah. And and in fact, when I first read it, the uh uh, uh RE dish, dish or whatever yeah. it was I thought that the reason that it was jammed we were oh, going yeah. to discover was because of them. Yes. Yes. God, that would have made so much sense. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. would have made so much sense, but... But it wasn't. It, no. we, we find out. It was not to be. Shame. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, it seems like they had a good chance to actually complete their mission because no one knew they were there. They right. could have gone unseen for... I mean, they could have gone unseen forever. You know, no one would have ever known they were there if they just, you know, mm-hmm. stayed inside the walls and inside whatever, you know, consoles or places they they were able to hide. But no. <laughs> yeah, and instead they shoot the hose. Yeah. Doctor McCoy learns of them and sticks them into Omri's cupboard. Exactly, it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> so they were completely ineffective, and uh, well, that's a shame. Very inept. Yeah. But um, you know, this is the cool part. You know, this is this is the part we've been dying to see uh, moving on yes. to the next section. This is the part that was teased on the teaser page. It is miniature Scotty versus a giant microbe. And there's some really cool artwork in here uh, starting yeah. on uh, on page 22, which um, this is some of my favorite stuff I've seen in Gold Key so far. I, I love God. Although agree. I have some serious issues with this creature. <laughs> I I think I think we may have the same issues. <laughs> yeah, let's hold off on talking about that until we get through this. But um, uh, as we know, the, the the there was a hole shot in the hose, and of course that did exactly what McCoy supposed it would do. It let in some microscopic particles that uh, are now going to start to menace poor Scotty. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's smaller than a grain of salt, uh, and there's nothing. He sees nothing in there, but just then, this monstrous germ appears. Uh, Scotty doesn't have any really have any place to run, so he keeps moving around trying to avoid this monster. As what appear to be, well, to him, large rocks are falling. He thinks that they're boulders, but they're actually just little pieces of dirt, uh, because you know he's so tiny. So Scotty starts to use those pieces of dirt as rocks to attack the giant germ that's after him and uh, it's it's quite an epic battle uh, that goes on here and uh, sadly this epic battle is not nearly as long as kirk's battle with the spaceships exactly yeah i think this would have benefited from being uh, a little bit longer but it's still pretty good and still pretty good so um just as scotty emerges triumphant from his battle he topples a what he thinks is a boulder on top of this uh, this giant germ, uh, this needle appears out of nowhere. It's Dr. McCoy. 
uh, sticking a giant needle in to rescue him. And he pulls Scotty out of the dome and uh, puts him on a glass slide. Uh, just as the, as Spock uh, says that he has a, a solution to this problem, they've made, they've made an anti-shrink ray, an experimental anti-shrink ray. So they begin to fire that at Scotty, and within seconds, he begins <laughs> to grow large again. Oh, boy. Yeah. So, um, you know. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So of course, yeah. Scotty is is big and he's naked. So uh, he's he's asking for some clothes, and just as the Enterprise uh, they they return to Kujal and Kirk tells the president about their breakthrough, and about Kawhi General Kawhi's treachery, sending the two soldiers to sabotage the mission, and he promises to send uh, enough of the uh, anti shrink machines so that they can uh, restore their entire population within a year. And she's very grateful, and General Kwai is going to get a special punishment. He will be the last person returned to full size. Spock is uh, happy with that punishment and says <laughs> it's a marvelous punishment for a big man like him. Uh, yeah, very big man in quotes. Yeah, in quotes. Yeah, well, um, there's a lot of unspock like moments that I oh yeah we have another one into here on that I one. can't wait to talk about. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, later, back on the Enterprise, uh, Scotty, Kirk, and Spock are discussing the events, and uh, they have a kind of a comedic ending or the uh, attempt at a comedic ending. <laughs> yeah, attempt I think is that. Uh, yeah, more like it. To, so they're talking about the Scotty saying that he'll never make fun of another man's size again. And uh, Spock says experience is a great teacher. And Kirk, uh, this is painful to read, but Kirk's <laughs> teacher, this kind of experience is a full professor. <laughs> oh, wow. N yeah, not not quite as funny as I, I guess the author thought it was going to be. Yeah, but I respect the fact that they attempt humor so again this is the end of the comic by the way the wrap-up was right. really that quick it was yeah. just two over... pages that's it yeah it was done um now really quickly i wanted to roll back a little bit though and talk about this awesome yet problematic microbe monster <laughs> Yes. And I think you know where I'm going with this. I love this thing. I think it looks really, really mm -hmm. cool. But why does it have a mouth and a tongue and attempt to eat Scotty? That does not make any right. sense. And why does it make sounds like, you know, and why can it Exactly. Um, it's a microscopic organism. It does not yeah. have vocal cords. It should not be able to make any sort of guttural noises, nor should it have a mouth and a tongue. Um, right. But I understand for the purposes of illustration, it has to look like a monster. And Alberto, I think, did a fantastic job with it. Really good job, yeah. It looks really, really great. And I wish we saw more aliens and monsters like this uh, in these Yeah, I, 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 I almost wish that this scene hadn't been in this comic and had instead you know that this creature was a normal sized alien yes that you know that that they encountered at some point and that that was you know sort of the the threat of whatever imaginary issue that was yes i i yeah absolutely this is that's the kind of monster that i would have loved to see like a whole planet of these things yeah you know, they beam down to some planet. Next thing you know, you got 20 of these things surrounding them. You know, and especially because they're, they're like, you know, they're all gloopy and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, so they, they could have easily just sort of, you know, absorbed or trapped or whatever yeah. uh, the crew. Like, I mean, there's, there's so much they could have done with that. Mm -hmm. But instead, we've just got, you know, it's a microbe and Scotty has to throw rocks at it. Although I, I did think... It was interesting, right? Because the the rocks, right, are just little dust particles. Yep. You know, and I thought that was a kind of a nice touch because, of course, there's going to be dust, and you know, if you're if you're going to have microbes in there, then of course there's going to be dust. And I love how like one already turns into kind of a, a hill. He's able to to push boulders, quote unquote, off of. Yeah, there's a big pile of dust. 
and uh, yeah, almost reminded me of the the Gorn fight from Cestus. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> by the way everybody ian's got a bell that he's ringing so in case you wonder what yeah. that was um yeah so only six dollars at office depot get yours now <laughs> office depot is not sponsoring this podcast uh <laughs> no but if they want to yeah. so <laughs> just, again just throwing that out there <laughs> another uh, another thing i just picked up on is this scotty is doing something that kirk was doing on the planet surface uh especially during this fight scene, he's telegraphing yes. everything. Uh, page 22, panel 2, has just what... This is just really weird dialogue. Scotty is standing there, and this is when the, the microbe monster first falls in, and Scotty says, and I quote, Wait, what is that falling, what is that falling toward me? How can there be anything else in this sterile world, oh mine? <laughs> I mean, why would you yeah, say that? Right. And then the next panel, Glory B, a microscopic monster, some germ that broke through the sealed system. I don't know. Maybe he can't see well out from the inside, but wouldn't he have seen that hose rupture? Because, I mean, you know. Heard it, something. It, if you go back to the panel where it does get ruptured, 21 or, mm. or 20 for everyone else. I just, you know, compared to Scotty, it's a fairly sizable explosion. It is. And he definitely would have at least heard it if he had not yeah. seen it, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. But he does telegraph, essentially telegraph the entire fight. Right. Because it's not enough that we just have an awesome, uh, you know, action sequence. We've got to have dialogue describing the awesome action sequence, too. Or the monologue, excuse me. The shame of it, in my mind, though, is that if these word bubbles weren't there to cover up some of this artwork, I think it would have been an even cooler sequence. Yeah, I have to agree with you there. Because there's a couple spots where some of the bubbles overlap the monster. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially the scene where Scotty is standing on top of the boulder mountain with the rock in his hand, which is what page 24 panel one. Yeah. Which is a great shot. And then there's like, uh, he's standing on a couple boulders and his own word blur. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think that would have looked that if that panel had no dialogue over it, it would have been epic. Yeah. It would have been epic. Totally shot. agree. So that that's a shame. But, um, uh, McCoy wears something he calls micro specs. Yeah. Which is a, I guess, a microscope fused with glasses. Yeah, I, okay. I can get behind that. Fair enough. I think that's that's a that's a neat little bit of technology. More uh, more devices being invented for Gold Key. Mm -hmm. So pretty cool. It's it yeah. looks exactly like a pair of uh, goggles with a uh, something a mad, like a mad scientist might wear or a super villain. Right. With a big yeah totally apparatus off of one of his eyes, his right eye. <laughs> And it's funny because, you know, McCoy plucks him out and puts him on a glass slide, mm. right? Like he's going to put him under a microscope. Yeah. And and I, I kept my thought went back to high school biology, right? Oh. And uh, I remember I was once, you know, for a, a lab that we were doing, we had these little paramecians, you know. Oh, cool. And. I was like just enthralled. This was like one of the first times I ever got to see a living thing that small through a microscope, if not the first. I think it might have even been the first. But the point being that uh, I was so enraptured by it. I was like, oh, let's see if we can mi magnify this even more. And uh, so I, I zoomed in and it, I didn't realize how far I was zooming in and the the lens of the microscope pressed against the glass and squished <laughs> my paramecium <laughs> and i i kind of expected as soon as as soon as he said all right scotty is on this glass slide i was like no just no. <laughs> just be careful yeah don't squish him <laughs> yeah uh, but instead he takes them over to a uh, anti-shrink ray yes that they have just built i guess right which is fast Wait, wouldn't you say insanely fast yeah 
uh, I guess Spock has Spock was working on this thing uh, all during Scotty's epic battle. And you look at the thing; it is not, you know, a, a, a small piece of equipment. This is um, oh, it's quite large. Yeah, this is something that looks like it was built into the room. So where did they build something that big and with a new technology? You know, the the anti shrink ray so fast maybe it's something they reconfigured yeah i guess that would have to be the medical device they already had right yeah that's that's my take on it that's the only thing i can think of because that it it almost looks like a drill press or something it's humongous right yeah yeah it is weird huh yeah and it makes weird noises too uh when scotty starts to (laughs) reappear it makes it makes a noise (laughs) plip p-l-i-p plip uh yeah and then that last panel uh, on that page is a little weird as the enterprise zooms away we see three word balloons emanating from the enterprise one saying hurrah the other saying yahoo and the third saying yow yeah and the enterprise itself makes a sound (laughs) swoosh (laughs) swoosh yeah it's a i I mean i like the shot of the enterprise they could have just uh left it without the word balloons maybe just added a um you know a triumphant the you know in a caption triumphant the enterprise mm. zips back to kujal or something you know yep that would have been something better. short and sweet yeah i guess yeah. we're supposed to we're supposed to believe that they're kind of partying inside the ship because they brought right. scotty back so yeah well apparent apparently they are because it seems everyone's got party fever especially spock in that last page <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And, the, you know, on the second panel of that last page, mm-hmm. Spock laughs. Yeah, ha, ha, and it's a very, ha. yeah, it's a very stilted laugh, too. Ha, yes. ha, ha, and with the hosel separating my way. dashes. Yep. Yeah, that, that's definitely incorrect. So they're laughing because Scotty is naked and he's growing back to normal size and he is requesting clothing because he's popping out of as he says popping out of the little loincloth ripped yeah this silly thing yeah so um and uh, spock and kirk both find that hysterical yeah and it was also i thought a little weird how he's like get me some clothes mom like yeah, he's jamaican mom? or something yeah what is that about it's, that's not that's yeah. not a scottish accent a little bit of weird well you know there's a another strange dialogue choice Back on page 24, when you see McCoy looking at the needle, he says, Scotty, he says, uh, yes, I can see him clearly through these micro specs. He's struggling like a demon. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, all of the demons that he has encountered before have all struggled. shown, uh, have all struggled. Yeah. So as far as McCoy knows, that's just a thing that demons do. They just struggle. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. So. That pretty much wraps up the story. Um, anything else you want to add before we give our non-canon essential votes? Well, yeah. I mean, I just want to I want to make some comments on the the really rushed ending because mm-hmm. it is super duper rushed. the 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 battle between Scotty and the the microbe I thought was just right uh, in terms of pacing and everything. The, the right number of pages, right number of panels. That was fine. Three pages. Uh, you, you had mentioned earlier that, you know, you could have cut back on uh, some of the pages of just, you know, just alone, just Kirk getting swarmed and all that by the rockets. And they should have taken those pages and given that to the, to the, the coda of the story, Yep. you know, because if we don't even get to see them. They're just talking about, Yep, we figured it out, and they're like, "Oh, thanks," and that's it, right? Like, um, the, the, there's a whole two panels where they're back on the planet, and that's it. And it's just, it's just too fast. It is. It would have been much nicer, I think, of an ending to see, you know, maybe the president and a couple of her aides or something uh, brought back to normal size, kind of shaking hands. Yes, with the Enterprise. Exactly. Crew. Say hey, you know, give us a happier ending because, as far as we know, like we're gonna give you the devices, and it's up to you guys to 
to grow yeah. yourselves back to your normal sizes again. So, uh, you know, we'll see you later. <laughs> We're out of here. Yeah. And, and, you know, and it would have been nice to see, you know, aside from just thank you, Captain, which is what the president says, to have her say, you know, uh, something along the lines of, you know, we were really distrustful of you at first, but you've proven yourselves to us. And, you know, now we're in your debt, yeah, blah, 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 you know, something. Right. Right. It's just, uh, here you go. We're going to go make a really bad joke now. Yeah. And you know what? This reminds me a lot of the ending to the um, the prior issue that we did, um, I think, a couple weeks ago where it was the, um, the the planet of the children who were diseased. Oh, yeah. And yes. the ending was, okay, we're going to have Starfleet ship you guys a bunch of that herb, and we're out of here. <laughs> that was pretty much it, yeah. right? <laughs> this is exactly the same ending. Yeah, and wasn't that one written by the same guy, too? Oh, you might be right on that. Maybe that's just a, maybe that's just a thing of his. But, but either way, like... There was a lot to like in this issue, I thought. Definitely. From an artistic standpoint alone, there was a lot to mm-hmm. like in this issue. It's interesting, the whole shrunken people angle. Mm-hmm. I think they, they, you haven't got to it yet on, on the animated series episodes, but the animated series has an episode like that, um, the Terratin incident. Yep. And, um, you know, I, I would say that that concept is probably done better in that. That's fine, though. Mm-hmm. This was definitely an enjoyable uh, issue, even though there were just a whole bunch of things that had me scratching my head. But that's just kind of me, anyway. <laughs> you know, this this was not this was not a bad one. No, it's definitely middle of the road. I think that yeah. the, the big highlight for me is the the epic battle between Scotty and the micro monster. I think that was. Despite the telegraphing and the awkward dialogue, I think that sequence is awesome from an artistic standpoint. Yeah, I, I love totally. how it was how it was done. The pacing was really good, as you said. I thought the creature was phenomenal. I love that. Yes. Um, you know, again, you love you know me and my non humanoid aliens in Star Trek. So uh, yeah. that that's an automatic win for me. Um, you know, I, I again I wasn't really fond of the length of time it took to get to the ending, um, the, of course, the pacing of the entire issue itself was was way off. But there are some really interesting concepts in here. Um, I, yeah. I kind of wish that a different word was used uh, to, to describe the waves. Uh, oh, boy, waves yeah. threw me <laughs> off a little bit. But uh, I, I like your your thought of, of reading it differently. <laughs> yeah. Uh, trying, to, trying to excuse it that way. But um, I would probably have to go essential on this one for a couple of reasons um some of the new technology that they introduce the um the uh, dish that's on the outside of the enterprise Mm -hmm. i like that that's pretty cool so there's a new apparatus that's part of the ship that we've never seen before so that's some interesting gold key cannon um who knows if it'll come up again but always neat uh some of the medical devices that mccoy has the um the little specs that he uses the micro specs are pretty cool. Uh, I like the fact that they build, they have this anti shrink machine on the Enterprise <laughs> yep. that they're going to now mass produce and ship. Um, the concept that radio waves can shrink people strange, interesting, yeah. weird. I don't know. Probably will never come up again, but I kind of like that. And of course, I, I love the, the the microbe monster. I like that that uh, in the Star Trek universe microbes are voracious monsters with little mouths <laughs> and tongues and tongues yes that's phenomenal so um yeah mediocre issue but i'm definitely i'm going essential on this one for several reasons so what about you well um you know going back to the to the very beginning we had the cover that seemed really strange right mm-hmm. we had uh, a red shirt who we now know is scotty on uh, you know, the head of a needle being looked at through by an eye that's, you know, looking through some sort of lens. We've got a Kirk getting taken down by rockets and tiny people overlaid over a sun. All those elements came together in this issue, maybe not in the best way that they could have, but it was a good attempt. 
They introduced a lot of really interesting ideas. Like you said, the monster was great. That whole sequence, I think, is is it made up for a lot of the episode uh, of the issue. And the um, the the spacewalk was also yep. really really cool. I thought, and something that we don't see often enough, in my opinion. And um, you know, all in all, it was you know, like I said, it was it was not a bad issue. And um, you know, all the concepts and everything that it, uh, they introduce were pretty believable. Yep. And uh, and and I think added an interesting bit of texture to uh, to to the Trek universe. And uh, so I think my my uh, vote as well is essential on this one. Oh, awesome! Oh, you know what? I have to throw one more thing in there. Uh, oh, what's that? And that's Ohura's character moment. Oh yeah, uh, Ohura's character moment of of the uh, bravery and heroism for volunteering to be the hostage that stays behind on the planet as the insurance policy uh, for the people of Kujal. I think that was awesome. I'm glad to see that uh, they gave Ohura that type of a moment in the comic. It's been a long time coming, and uh, yeah. I hope that we see more. And well, Hint, hint, we will see more. <laughs> so uh, awesome. So double essential on, on, a, on a gold key. That's really yeah. cool. Very, very cool. So um, yeah, all right. So wrapping up, uh, we are the tricordertransmissions.com. If you're looking for us on our website, we're also on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash the tricorder transmissions, Twitter, TTT underscore pod. Uh, my personal Twitter is J underscore Ben. Where can we find you? Twitter at Ian one, two, eight K as in Hilo. And, uh, if you want to follow along with the, uh, updates that I do on my comic, uh, mostly I've been doing writing right now, but if you want to follow along anyway, uh, it's at in the Starfleet, and uh, that's it. Very cool. You can also find us on uh, Redbubble.com if you're looking for some merchandise. Check out Redbubble.com. Search for a try. Some really good merchandise, guys. Very good stuff. And uh, if you would be so kind, we I know we've been asking everybody to do this, so if you're getting tired of hearing us say this, uh, we apologize. But if you would be so kind as to go over to iTunes and offer us uh, a rating that would be wonderful if you only feel like putting in a star rating that even that would help uh just to get some uh get get our numbers up and and get us out in front of more people and help us build our audience we would be very very appreciative and uh as always we love talking to you guys on social media thanks for everybody who uh, chimes in on our episodes every week on facebook and twitter always always a pleasure to talk to all you guys out there and uh ian it's been a pleasure talking with as you always again. all right yes we will be back next week with another episode of the tricorder transmissions same trek time same trek channel hi there thanks again for listening if you're cruising the galaxy looking for even more Trek talk, why not visit our good friends Bill and Dan over at TrekGeeks.com? They've got a great podcast that covers a wide range of Star Trek topics, so you're sure to find something you'll love. And if you're in the mood for some awesome tunes, then you really need to head over to 5 The guys are writing a song for every episode of the original series, and each one is absolutely brilliant. So that's TrekGeeks.com and 5 Check them out today.